All right. Well, the last time I sat here, we we talked about, I believe it was confession and accountability. Now, how has that gone for everybody? Anybody started confessing sin and and uh, confessing it to God, have you, have you, has God reminded you of sin, maybe even from the past, over the past couple of weeks that you needed to confess to Him and ask forgiveness for? Uh, I, I hope I'm not the only one. Craig gave me a little nod, yes. Um, so I'm glad I'm not the only one. But we talked about when God brings those things to our mind, uh, that we need to ask forgiveness for those things. Because if we let sin linger in our lives, we looked at the physical aspects of that, the spiritual aspects of that, and it could just crush us. So tonight we're going to be talking about something that is just as frustrating sometimes, it seems, as not wanting to confess sin or have accountability. And that is essentially the flip side of that. We're going to be talking about forgiveness and restoration. So this is going to be a, uh, just a standalone message tonight. As you know, we've got a lot of folks at the funeral home this evening for a funeral that started around 6 o'clock. So it's just going to be us here tonight. And then next week, we're going to get into learning how to pray the Psalms, learning how to uh, look at the Psalms, pray through those, and, and let that be a part of our everyday life. Uh, we also are going to give you a book. We're going to hope to give you one per adult, or if not, one per family. But I don't know. We've got 50 ordered. we got 50 here. So we're going to give you a book. It's only like 90-something pages. Really quick read. It's a pretty good read. It'll help transform your prayer life. And that is the elders' hopes here is that our, our prayer life would be transformed as well. But tonight, just briefly, I want to talk about forgiveness and restoration. So how many of you have ever sinned against somebody? How many of you have ever been sinned against? Now, let me ask you this question. If you sin against somebody and you ask forgiveness, that's a little bit easier. We want them to forgive us for our wrongdoing, right? But what if somebody sins against us and comes offering forgiveness? Is that harder sometimes? How old are you? Nine. Nine years old saying yes. That's a little harder. When we have to offer forgiveness, we want forgiveness, but sometimes we don't want to give forgiveness, do we? Is it tough for anybody else sometimes? And really, I guess it depends on what has happened, what the sin is that you're having to forgive, right? So if Philip runs into me and knocks me down and he says, oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I'm like, oh, no worries, it's good. But if he walks up and uh, punches me in the throat, goes outside and slashes my tires, and then tells me I'm a worthless piece of garbage... I'm, I don't know if I'm going to forgive him as quickly, am I? And that's just not even, that's kind of my extreme kid rated example, right? I just don't want to go any further than that. But it's a little more extreme than him just accidentally bumping into me and say, oh, forgive me. I didn't watch where I was going. It depends, I think. It, does it, is it just me sometimes if the sin is small? Okay, I forgive you. But what about when that sin is great? What about when that sin is big? What do we think? Is it a little harder to extend forgiveness then? It's according to if they ask if somebody asks to forgive them, sometimes I think it's easier than if they don't and you're just trying to just do it. Say that again. You said if... Okay. Well, that, that's a great, leads a great question. If somebody sins against you, should we wait till they ask us to forgive them? No, but, but I, I think that she is right on the money here. If they don't ask forgiveness, it's easier to harbor that, isn't it? And, and if we harbor that, what they've done to us, it's easy to turn into bitterness. And it's easy to turn into bitterness and anger and frustration and, w- and ultimately, what happens in that situation is you then become one who is in sin if we're not careful. Because that bitterness could cause you to lash out, that bitterness could cause you to do other things. But when it comes to forgiveness, should there be a length of time before we say, Yes, you're forgiven? Now, that's a hard question. I see some people thinking, I see some people saying no. So if somebody says, Ryan, will you forgive me for A, B, and C? 
Is there a length of time for you to say, you know what, thank you for asking, I will one day? Or if I see true repentance in your life, then I will forgive you? Or should that forgiveness be immediately? Forgive immediately? Anybody else? That's a great question. But you think you can forgive? Say it again. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Yes. Those are two different things. They're, they don't always happen together. That's right. Um, I can forgive you and us still not be reconciled to each other. Um, forgiveness. What, what am I stepping on your toes here? What, what no. is forgiveness? Yes. Let's go there. What it what does it mean to forgive? Right? Forgiveness forgiveness is not requiring payment for that debt, for that sin debt. It's not seeking revenge, repayment, justice, understanding. Right? Sometimes we say, I want them to understand how they made me feel. Right? That's not forgiveness. Right? Forgiveness is saying, I don't need anything from you. There is no debt there. Right? And I don't have to tell you that. That's another thing. It, it's not necessary that I come to you and say, by the way, I forgive you. Right? You can forgive without ever talking to the person, and you can forgive without them ever asking for it. Sometimes forgiveness is for me, not for them. However, it, 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 is, it is for you. I have heard people say forgiveness is for you and not for them. I disagree. Oh, no, I wouldn't go there. It's, it's both. It's a both and. Well, I think forgiveness forgiveness starts with the understanding that I am not God in that person's life. That's right. I have no right to demand what you said, justice, payment, punishment. That's not mine. Yeah. Like Romans 14 says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He is the one who judges. He is the one who goes up for this. He's the only one who can judge justly. And so with the first step of forgiveness is admitting, I'm not God in your life. I don't have the right to impose penalty, judgment, punishment at all. And I, and I can't. And I can't. I can't. I cannot. I cannot impose a just judgment on your sin. I can't. It's not... It's not in my ability. Reconciliation, though. For us to be reconciled to each other, that requires repentance. Right? Reconciliation requires repentance. That's, that's a restoration of the relationship. Right? That's, that is different. Forgiveness is also a requirement of that, right? Repentance and forgiveness are required for reconciliation. But you can forgive and the relationship not be reconciled. I think a lot of the fear with forgiveness is if I forgive you, I'm saying that what you did to me doesn't matter or that it didn't hurt or that it caused no pain. There's a fear that if I forgive you, then I'm just dismissing what you did, right? But forgiveness doesn't erase. Well, time later. The forgiveness <laughs> doesn't erase what has happened. You have a mommy, Michaela. <laughs> she really does her shit. Um, but forgiveness doesn't erase the bad. It doesn't. It doesn't say, "Oh, this never happened." We can, you know, it, the pain is still there. The hurt is still there. The broken relationship is still there, right? And that takes time to rebuild, right? So you can forgive, like you said. Without saying, we're just going to pretend like this never happened. right? Where there is broken trust, that trust has to be rebuilt. And trust takes time. Right? So forgiveness and, like you said, reconciliation are two completely different things. Right? Reconciliation takes time. It takes repentance. It takes uh, you know, grace. It takes time to rebuild the, the relationship to where it is. And you may never get there. 
But forgiveness says, I'm no longer going to hold you accountable to me. In some sense, I'm going to turn you over to God. You'll answer to God for what you've done. And I'm going to take myself off the throne and let God be your judge. I'm not, I'm not seeking repayment. I'm not seeking... Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I think that I think we're we're moving past the original question okay. just a bit. We're kind of talking yes, but there's still a, a question on the table. And if I'm hearing it right, can I forgive someone that hasn't truly changed? Is that what you're getting at? So let's set up a scenario. Just say that you've been sinned against. Somebody has sinned against you, and then are you saying now they want to reconcile, or they're just saying... So you're asking, can you still forgive without them asking for forgiveness? Yeah. So I, if I'm hearing correctly, I th before a reconciliation takes place, I think um, what, they, what these guys were saying is that does take more time. And I think there has to be a level of at least saying, will you forgive me for, and if they, maybe, maybe they don't even know they've hurt you, right? So that may be a conversation that you would have to say, listen, when you did this or said this, that really hurt me, you know, it, it hurt my family or whatever the case may be. And that may bring to their mind, well, I didn't even know that. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? Right? Or they may just be um, wanting to get back in, reconcile with you, and everything be good to go. But I think that's when you put people, not, not necessarily push people out, but leave them at arm's length. Right? And I can tell you this has happened in my own marriage. She told me not to talk about us anymore, but <laughs> she's mad at me. But this has happened in all your marriages too. You've done something stupid. And you, you automatically want to be like, hey, let's just get back to the way we were. And she's like, hold up, Jack. <laughs> you know, this is not just a, uh, you messed up and we're all good. We, we need to process this. There needs to be time. There needs to, so I hear, I see some married guys saying, yes, so I'm not the only one, right? So uh, this happens in all of our relationships, whether you're married or not. So I think that just jumping in to reconciliation is probably not the wisest thing to do. I think there does need to be that time. And uh, to, that way, I mean, yes, you can forgive them without them even asking for forgiveness. As a matter of fact, I believe we're supposed to. Uh, and I'll read a scripture here in just a second that would back up that claim. But then I think it just takes time and com communication. And I was going to say, we don't have to ignore, you don't have to ignore your own person. Right? When somebody's, if they want to pretend it doesn't happen, it never happened or it didn't matter, you can still say, no, I'm still hurting, and I need time to deal with that, either with the Lord or with you or whatever, but I need time to process that, and that's completely fine and good and natural, right? We need time to deal with our pain. We need to, so there's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, I think rushing right back into reconciliation as if nothing of any consequences happened is unwise and often more hurtful than helpful. I, I used to think that forgiveness meant acting like it never happened. That's how I grew up. Right? And, and that's, for one, unrealistic. Right. Right? That's, that's impossible. Forgiveness doesn't mean necessarily acting like it never happened. Right. Um, I mean, you went extreme early. Let's go extreme. You chopped my arm off. <laughs> right? You're not going to forget that. There's no way <laughs> to act like that never happened. Right? I mean, that's, that's just unrealistic. So, you know, depending on the situation, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes boundaries are necessary. That's right. And that's not, we, we mistake that for, for punishment, right? And that is something that we need to ask ourselves. Am I behaving towards this, this, this person like this 
as a form of punishment for what they've done to me, right? Or or is this or is this behavior, this relationship, the way it is, because that's what needs to be. That that is what's that's healthy. Insane. That's that. There's there's a difference there, right? And if someone's unrepentant in their sin, if someone's unrepentant in their toward in their be pattern of behavior towards you, then I think you are completely and absolutely justified in setting some boundaries, right? right? And saying, I'm sorry, I forgive you, but until you're willing to change, we, we can't be this way, whatever, whatever that is, right? I, I think that for me, I, I learned what resentment was, um, so whenever someone hurts me, like, and like using your cutting your arm off reference, like they've cut my arm. I no longer have an arm. This is an event that happened one day. So now I'm re mad at them for the next six years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm harboring hate. So like I can choose to forgive them in the beginning, uh, or I can choose to forgive them in six years. It's just the level of discomfort I want to be in during that period of time because the, the offense has already happened to me. Um, and, with forgiveness, I don't have to be their friend again. I don't have to reconcile with them. I just have to release that negative feeling I have towards them. You know, like, but if I'm harboring negative feelings towards like them, that's something on my side. You know, I can't change the action, um, but I'm just re-hurting myself. And I'm re-harboring like grief with them. I'm re-harboring that hurt, and I'm just I'm making myself well um, over and over again. So I gotta I gotta release them from that. You know, like I can't be hateful towards them in the heart. I'm expecting them to be different. So. That's been something for me. I don't, I don't have to reconcile with them, you know, at all. But I'll be secretly mad at them for, as long as it makes me uncomfortable, you know. For, forgiveness is not necessarily a one-time thing, right? That's a good point. It's somebody hurts you, right? In our super extreme example, or somebody cuts your arm off, right? I mean, this is this is something you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life. And every time that you think of this thing. It might cause pain once That's again, right. right? It's something that happened a long time ago, That's right. but it can cause me pain today. That's right. And therefore, it's one, it's okay. And two, it's okay to forgive them for this new pain that I'm feeling for this thing that happened That's a long right. time ago, right? Well, um, we'll leave scars. Yeah. You know, and sometimes we have to forgive. Day after day after day after day, and over time, sometimes it gets easier, right? So sometimes not. Sometimes or, not. Or you forgive them, and they come back, and they cut your other arm off. Well, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's kind of one of those yeah. things, and then you've got these feelings all over again. Yeah, that that leads to other things. Yeah. Okay, time to wrap well, yeah, so I, I'm listening to, to you guys talk, and y'all are making some great points. Um, so we, we've heard the saying, forgive and forget, right? Which that's not, I mean, if your arm's cut off, how are you going to forget that somebody cut your arm off? You can't. However, I believe that when we say forgive and forget, we need to forget biblically, right? So... What I mean by that, and forget biblically, is when that hurt comes back up, that can quickly cause us bitter, anger, frustration. But if we've already forgiven them, we need to forget about the anger, bitterness, frustration, and be reminded biblically, okay, this is what God has done for me in Christ. I've already forgiven them this, because if you get back into a time where it comes back up, and you let those old wounds fester and, and just you open that up and you don't do anything about it and it's just nasty and gross and it gets worse and worse, then it becomes a bigger issue and you're, you're mad again, you're frustrated again, you want to go cut somebody, cut their arm off because they cut yours off, right? Um, but when we say forgive and forget, that doesn't mean forget about the pain, forget about the hurt, but, but it means don't go back to pre-forgiveness, when you were angry and bitter and, and, and things like that, because that, again, could lead us into sin when that happens. And the Bible tells us that we are to forgive those 
that have sinned against us. As a matter of fact, um, verse 14 of Matthew chapter 6 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. No. It is the Lord's prayer. Yeah. So we definitely need to think in terms of what the Lord is saying here in this prayer That is, we ask him for forgiveness, don't we? And he does. He's faithful and just to forgive us. So when others ask us to forgive them, we need to be like him and faithfully forgive others. We don't have to forget, but the more we continue to forgive and rest in Christ, that those wounds begin to heal a little more and those scars begin to fade over time because we're resting in the finished work of Christ. We're resting in the forgiveness of God. And when we forgive others, he'll forgive us. And it's pretty, it's pretty dangerous thing to think about not forgiving others. And if we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. What does it mean? I said conditional salvation. Not what it means. It's not conditional. Yeah, right. It's not what it means. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, I think it, uh, so I think if we fail to sin, uh, I mean, fail to forgive, it leads to sin, and it leads to what we were talking about the last time I was sitting here, and the more we let that fester in us, the more our bones and we waste away, and we, we are in sin ourselves. I think it's deeper than that. I think that if you have a heart that is not willing to forgive, then you have not been truly forgiven of your own sin. Oh, yeah. Salvation. Yeah. Because Jesus will go on to tell the parable of the, uh, the uh, unjust steward, you know, the large debt or whatever, the unforgiving uh, servant. I can't remember. Anyway, long story short, we are called to forgive with the same standard that we've been forgiven. Mm-hmm. And in that, in that parable, Jesus says, if you've been forgiven such a large debt, how can you refuse to forgive such a little debt? Right? That's the unforgiving too. So that, that passage right there is simply saying that people who have been transformed by the grace of God and truly been forgiven will naturally forgive. And if your heart is resistant to forgiveness, or hard toward forgiveness, then you need to get to the foot of the cross and check your own salvation. That's right. So let me put this scenario in front of you. Not just you, everybody. Uh, professing believer. Um, see, kind of, they're not even listening. Molested as a young person. Grows up, finds Christ, or is saved. Jesus wasn't lost. We were. <laughs> Um, repents and believes, says they're a believer in their older age, they hear something like this and say, we must forgive others. And, and, and you meet forgiveness with the person that did this to them when they were younger. And there's a lot of hurt there, right? There's a lot of emotional baggage there. But can we forgive that person? to realize just how deep that pain really was. Maybe you have to go back and forgive again. And you go back another layer, and maybe you have to go back and forgive again. You know what I mean? It's not just a one-time. Uh, oh, I'm not saying that. Right. I'm talking about the person that says, I can never forgive him for what he did as a professing believer. We're not talking about that first layer of the onion. We're talking about getting to that first layer where they can truly forgive. As a professing believer, should they and can they forgive that person for what they did? Should they? Yes. yes. Sometimes it takes praying and asking, asking God right. to help me. I'm glad you said that because forgiveness is not in and of ourself. That's right. There is nothing in us that would ever want to forgive somebody that hurts us. Right. Nothing, natural about nothing natural about it. Matter of fact, we're, we're kind of Old Testament. We want to be eye for an eye. You hurt me, I'm coming right back at you. Right? You're going to cut my arm off, I'm cutting off two of yours. What's that movie, Monty Python? Whatever. I've never seen it, but I mean, I've seen part of it, but not one of my favorites. I know y'all can save the tomatoes for later. Anyway, but you know, that's what our natural flesh, our natural reaction is. You mess with me, I'm messing with you. 
but it's only by the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to forgive others, whether it's a small sin or something greater like being molested as a child. The, the Spirit within us can cause us to forgive. And if I may, the Spirit in us should cause us to read texts like, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That should be a warning for us. It's a heavy passage, and it is not one that I think that we should be prideful about and say, well, you don't know what he did. And we, we may not know what he did or she did, right? But we are not forgiving them and saying, like Philip said, I give you a pass. It's okay that you did that. That is not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not that. So what would we say forgiveness is? And you said it, not you don't owe me anything. I'm wiping the slate clean. You're forgiven. Uh, I don't want vengeance. I'm not seeking vengeance because God has forgiven me in Christ. I'm going to extend the same forgiveness to you. Uh, you can push them on out of the way and say we will not be reconciled until God does that too. But as for me, you are forgiven. That's right. Yep. And a lot of times we find somebody that sins against us. Every one of us has said we've sinned against somebody, and we've all been changed by the glory of God, by the grace of God. So he can change both parties, right? So as true believers, we must be willing to forgive the most difficult sins that were committed against us. We must be willing to do it not just, well, maybe in six years I can, we should say, because of Christ, I will. And then that reconciliation can happen like we've talked about. But that leads to the next question that you kind of hinted to. If they cut off one arm and then you forgive them, they cut off and cut off your other arm, what, what do you do? And Philip said, how many times should we forgive somebody? Well, if you got um, a Bible, let's see. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Huh? And I, I don't want to I don't want to read the whole parable here, but I do want to hone in on this one thing that will help us get some clarity on how many times we should forgive someone that sins against us. In verse 21, it says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And then Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. You've heard seventy times seven, right? So some of you math folks are like, 490 times? Is that the limit? Is that seventy times seven? Okay. 490. <laughs> Quick math. 490 times, that's the limit. But here's the problem with that. If you start thinking in terms of, well, they're at 489, the Bible also says this, love keeps no record of wrongs. So what's happening here in Judaism, three times was sufficient. I can, I can forgive Philip three times in Judaism. After that, no more. So Peter here is like, Seven. What about seven, Lord? I'm, look at me, seven times? He said, nope. So when Jesus says 70 times seven, what he's ultimately saying is, number one, don't even keep count. But number two, there is no number. Anytime somebody sins against you, you forgive them. So then we start thinking about, well, my goodness, that, I mean, before long, I'm not going to have nothing but a torso and a head left, you know? And, uh, but... Saying that what you did didn't hurt or didn't matter. And that's where right. the boundaries come into conversation. Okay. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. You know, do we put ourselves back in that same situation? Right. If, did if you there's know there's that true it's. True repentance and there's reconciliation there. Maybe. Well, at that moment, you think there is. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And then somewhere down the line, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to use my sister and because that's what I'm talking about, you know, and because all of our lives there's been something that's happened and it's, it's, it's like ongoing, you know, and 
you know, do we, you know, is it okay, I guess what I'm asking, is it okay to not put ourselves in that situation? Yes. Yes. I mean, I, could, I mean, I've done it several times, you know, and, and tried, but then it's just like, it's like she's a different person, you know. Yeah. And, but anyway, um, so I just want to make sure that I'm. It's, it's okay so, not to. Thank you. And it's okay too. Okay. I mean, how many times have I sinned against Jesus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For the same sin. For the same sin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. Many times. Yes. Uh, and, and I'm forgiven every time. Yes. And so. But that doesn't mean that your sin doesn't have consequences. It? That's right. That's, yeah. Jesus, exactly. will for, Jesus will forgive you. If you're a repeat offender, grace is for repeat offenders. And Jesus will continue to give you repeat offenses to glory. If you're, you know. But your sin has consequences. Right. It may have consequences in your life. It may have consequences in the lives of those that you love, your family, your friends, your work, whatever it may be. But sin has consequences. So it's guaranteed to have consequences in your life, but it right. may have bigger consequences. So just because you've been forgiving of something doesn't mean that the consequences magically go away. That's right. And that's the same thing with our interpersonal relationships. Yes, I can. We can forgive to the others. That doesn't mean that the relational consequences go away. So if there are healthy boundaries, if there's a safe distance that needs to be cultivated in that relationship, or even if the relationship needs to come to an end, that's okay. Even if you've already forgiven, if you go to reconcile, they want you to bring that sin back. I mean, I think as Christians, we are called to leave the pathways of reconciliation open. We're not called to just shut the gate forever and say, you know, never, ever again. But there's their caution is if there's caution that's warranted, then that's okay too. But we are called to keep the pathway of reconciliation open. If someone comes genuinely seeking reconciliation, we can walk down that road with them. But that doesn't mean we just jump in with both feet. You know, it's okay to take your time and rebuild the relationship, rebuild the trust. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. There's a passage of Scripture, too, that I'd like for us to look at. Psalm chapter 103, if you got your Bibles. I think this is, this is encouraging for the sinner, which is all of us. Uh, we just mentioned that there are consequences for sin, but I want to show how we should not presume upon the grace of God, although we likely have many times, and we've likely been scorned and... and uh, chastened for our sin, but I want to show you how great and awesome our God is. Psalm chapter 103, starting in verse 8, says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Just those three passages of Scripture for the sinner should have us standing in awe of who God is. Especially when we read, He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquities. He could do, thank God, anything He wanted to do. He could discipline us in any way, yet He is patient, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So if we think about a God who is like that with us, that should motivate us even more to extend forgiveness to others. Um, yeah, chastise. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think of, like a whip, getting after you with a whip. Or in my house, getting around with that belt. Um. But I think a lot of us have this idea that God is 
I mentioned this a few weeks ago in the sermon that God is like a God with a magnifying glass holding it right in direct line with the sun trying to burn us up. But that is not who God is. Yes, God is going to give us consequences for our sin, but man, just these three verses should drive us to worship. We talk about theology leading to doxology. This should drive us to sing how great you are, God, how great on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand because our God is gracious and merciful, and we should be that very way with other people. And again, we've talked about the boundaries. That is acceptable. That is something that we need to do. Uh, but I want to look at a, a st- first I want to look at the time. Okay, I got a little bit. I want to look at a, a story that we're all likely familiar with, and I want to kind of look at the end of it. So if you've got your Bible still open, go to Genesis chapter 50. So how many of you know the story of Joseph? Let's kind of quickly go through this story. First of all, what was it about Joseph? Something special about Joseph. Multicolored coat. Who gave him that coat? His father did. Why did his father give him a multicolored coat? He was the favorite, right? So he had some brothers. How did the brothers feel about this? They hated him for it, didn't they? So the, the brothers start to come up with a plan. They're going to deal with Joseph. So what did the brothers do? Threw him into a pit. That's number one, huh? Sold him into slavery. Told his dad he was dead. Then what happens? He ended up at Potiphar's house. What happened in Potiphar's house? A wife accused him of raping him. Yep, he fled in the nude, right? So people saw him running, running away with no clothes on. So naturally, people are going to believe Potiphar's wife. So what happens? This is after he had risen up into this, this palace in the Potiphar's house. So what happens then? Throw him in prison, right? So then in prison, uh, they learn, Pharaoh, is it Pharaoh that learns that he can um, interpret dreams? So finally, uh, the guy, one of them that gets out forgets about him, and then he finds out that this guy, Joseph, can interpret dreams, brings him up, he interprets the dream, what happens? Rises to second in command of all of Egypt, right? So then, what happens? There's a famine in the land, and Joseph is pretty smart, right? So he said, there, we, we need to be very... huh? Frugal, yes. Yeah, very frugal in the months of plenty, in the years of plenty. So when the seven years of famine hit, we'll have some to to lean into to keep us alive. So who comes looking for food? His brothers, the same ones that told their dad he was dead, the same ones that threw him in the pit, sold him into slavery. And when they come to Egypt to ask, they have to talk to who? Their brother, Joseph. Now, do they recognize Joseph? Nope. Why? Because he's an Egyptian by now. He is completely conformed to the culture, wearing the makeup, the things. He looks just like an Egyptian, walking like one too, however that is. Um, But he looks like an Egyptian, talks like an Egyptian, acts like an Egyptian. And then uh, his brothers come up. They don't recognize him. And then through a series of things that Joseph does, they ultimately come back and they recognize him right? So if we're thinking about the story in, our, in terms of our own flesh, if we were Joseph, I would dare say 99.9999% of you in here would say, when they were bowed in front of me, I would smash every one of them in the teeth. Yes, you would. And the other 0.00001% of you would be lying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maybe you wouldn't, really, but I would be like, mm, now's my chance. They're bowing in front of me. I'm second in command of this place. They're begging for food. But that's not what Joseph does, is it? They find out who he is. It, the Bible says that, that he lays across their neck and they weep and they are, are reconciled. But if we look at Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 15, what did I say? Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. Okay, did I say it completely backwards? Oh, 50, 15, sorry. 
So uh, now their dad is dead. Verse 15 says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Huh? Huh? Am I in the place of God? What does that mean, Philip? Well, he says, it's not my right to, to hold this over you, to hold you accountable, or to dole out the punishment you deserve. That's not my place. Right. Uh, that belongs to God and God alone. Exactly. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right? So we have these, this family that was broken by sin after sin after sin after sin after sin. And, and through a series, and I think this goes back to what we ultimately began talking about with the question, is Joseph didn't just immediately accept them back, did he? If you know the story, he did some things to see how true they were, right? Didn't he plant the money bag and, and some money and stuff in there just to see? And then he said, hey, let me keep one of you here, and then we're going to see how truthful you really are. So he had those boundaries for his brothers before he fell on their necks in forgiveness and reconciliation. And I believe had not these brothers proved themselves to be truly repentant and truly seeking forgiveness, we likely wouldn't have seen the reconciliation. But notice what also he says, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good. So we talked about this a lot before uh, that we read in Romans chapter 8 that God works all things out for his glory and our good, right? So even if someone sins against you, somehow he is getting his glory through it and it is for your good, right? You mentioned the story uh, with your family member. We don't understand that on this side of eternity. We may not know what's going on, how God's getting his glory from this. I can tell you one way he's getting it right now is because you're learning through the word how to forgive, how to set up boundaries, how to hopefully keep from being hurt again right? How to continue to forgive. You don't have to forget, but we don't have to be reconciled right now either, right? So even in that, God is getting glory because you're here tonight learning these things and hearing these things. So God is going to get his glory through all things and ultimately even, even our good, right? For those that trust in him, for those that believe in him, we still may not understand how is this going to be for my good, but I bet you you're going to find yourself getting stronger and stronger in your faith, relying on who God is, trusting his word, and saying, God has told me to forgive, so I'm going to forgive again, right? So it's strengthening you. You're, you're enduring this life that we live in, and not just you, everybody in here, right? So forgiveness is one of those things that is, I believe, is part of our sanctification, so if we don't forgive, then we're harboring, we're bitter, we're angry, we're in sin. And I think we stall in our, in our sanctification. So I believe that we must forgive, not in our own power, because we never would, but by the power of God, asking Him to help us forgive, and then doing so because His Word tells us to, and then working on reconciliation afterwards, Right? Um, what was I talking about tonight? Forgiveness and what else? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Okay, so we've we've kind of talked through that. It's seven twenty six. Um, does give us good things in life. Um, we're blessed with things like that, but our good and His glory is sanctification. That's right. 
Otherwise, the blue one is not there. So you make a great point. Um, me and her have been talking for days about this very thing, but I think that we have, as Americans especially, we have this flawed view of what our good is, right? We think it's good for us, good things for us, that something good will come of this, that it's going to be some grand thing. In, re in reality, it is a grand thing, right? Sanctification is grand. But everything that we do in life is not even about us, right? So if we forgive or if we do something expecting to get from God, then I think we're forgiving for the wrong reason. And that sanctification is our good, that becoming like Christ. I've been, some of you may have seen this, if you stuck around to read it all, it was pretty long. I put a Facebook post up yesterday. I'm reading this book right now. I can't put it down. It's called The Exemplary Husband. And in that, it, it shows a picture of really who we as humans are, that we seek everything selfishly, that we're selfish individuals. Like even in our marriages, we think that our spouse has to meet this need, this need, this need, and this need, or they have to do this, 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 say this, love me, respect me. And we think that's what we expect from our marriages and our relationships. But in reality, we should be expecting and desiring God, His Word, Christ, sanctification, those things. Those things of God is what we should be pursuing and desiring more than anything. And then the rest, when it comes to our relationships, fall into place. So the same could be said about um, forgiveness and reconciliation. If we're truly seeking the Lord in all things, if we're truly seek, because we could be really selfish, couldn't we? The next time you're, and I don't want to say who your family member is just because of this, but you're, if you're, next time your family member comes to you and offer, asks you, asks, asks you for forgiveness, you do it for the glory of God, right? You're not doing it to appease her or him. You're not doing it to make yourself feel better. Right, you're doing it because God and His Word has declared for us to do so, and you want to be obedient to Him, and the Holy Spirit's going to give you that power to do it and to work in you to, as we've mentioned, be able to reconcile one day, whether it be tomorrow or 10 years from now, right? But uh, when we do the forgiving part for the glory of God and not for us, because, again, the selfish part could kick in and be like, you did this to me. I'll never forgive you for this. You are an awful person, right? Because our feelings are at stake. And if we do that, it is likely that we'll never forgive until we truly seek the glory of God in forgiveness and then truly seek the glory of God in reconciliation and do what Colossians chapter 3 says and keep our eyes focused on the things above, not on things of this world. We do things for the glory of God and all things fall into place, in my opinion. In my opinion, it isn't worth much, but <laughs> any other thoughts, comments, questions? We talked about a lot, I feel like, in an hour. All right, well, Ryan, do you mind closing us in a word of prayer? Another opportunity you've allowed us to come together.